Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are starting our session. So what we're going to do is talk about individual rights. And I've got an awful lot of material on here. So we're just going to zoom on through it, baby. And if you miss something, you can somehow you can wait eight months for this to come out and, and, and watch it. Or you can ask me later. I've also got copies of, of five of my titles available for purchase. And I want you to purchase them only on their merits, not because I am telling you that we're expecting our fourth child in February and we need some extra cash. That's irrelevant, OK? Just on their merits, I want you to consider purchasing them. So I guess those of you who are here with me today have got this outline. And I think it's on pink sheets. So we're going to get in touch with our feminine side and start looking at this outline. And so if you have the outline, it's easier to follow along. That's why I'm, that's why I'm making it. So first, before we talk about rights, we've got to define what the term means. What exactly is a right? There are a great many definitions of rights, but one that I like and that others in this sort of tradition like comes from a guy who's still alive, Father James Sadowski, who was a professor of business ethics at Fordham for many years, one of the few non-commie professors of business ethics, by the way. And Sadowski's definition is as follows. He says, when we say that one has the right to do certain things, we mean this and this only, that it would be immoral for another, alone or in combination, to stop him from doing this by the use of physical force or the threat thereof. Now notice he does not say, in fact, he goes on to clarify this. He says, we do not mean that any use a man makes of his property within the limits set forth is necessarily a moral use. So people may do something that's immoral and still, strictly speaking, be within their rights. So not every vice is or should be criminalized. So you can break promises, by and large. You can be a liar. You can be late all the time. But by and large, these aren't things we're going to throw you in jail for. I mean, and strictly speaking, you. Strictly speaking, you have a natural right to be late, even if it's really annoying. So in other words, a right is, in effect, it's a sphere of action in which you can act and in which it would be morally wrong for anyone to interfere with you violently or with a threat of violence. Now, I think it's been taken for granted by many people that rights and rights language is a relatively recent development in the history of Western civilization. But I think that's not correct. It depends on how you define recent. A lot of people would say, would, were of the opinion, until relatively recently, that really this is a 17th century development. John Locke and others were really the first to start talking about rights and using the language of rights. That thesis has, by and large, been abandoned by scholars. Because it now looks as if the history of rights goes back a lot farther in the history of Western civilization. It goes back at least to the 12th century. So it goes actually back to the Middle Ages, where we start to hear the language of rights. And I refer in my sources at the end of the outline to a book by Brian Tierney called The Idea of Natural Rights. And he's really the pioneer in this area. And he elaborates on some of these points. But we see it all throughout Europe by the, by the 12th century. And we hear it being used in this sense, that the Lord has rights, vassals have rights, popes have rights, kings have rights, cities have rights. So these aren't quite natural rights, because a natural right is a right that's enjoyed by all people by virtue of being human, not by virtue of being a pope or a king or a lord or a vassal. So these aren't natural rights, but nevertheless, the language of rights permeates European society by this time. And even though they're not quite natural rights yet, once you start talking about rights, there's a certain internal dynamic to them that's going to lead us down the path to natural rights. And just to give you one example, medieval cities were really oases of freedom amidst an otherwise uh, social system of, of stagnation, such that the various cities of medieval Europe did enjoy certain rights vis-a-vis -vis political authorities. And they would insist on the expansion of these rights over time. And one of the rights the cities typically enjoyed was that if you lived in a city for a year and a day, undetected, you were free of all servile obligations. So if a serf managed to flee and live in a city for a year and a day, nobody could 
come and try and take him away. That was one of the rights of the cities, that we can protect these people. So there was a case, for example, when the Count of Flanders happened to be in a nearby city, and he spotted one of his old serfs who had lived there longer than a year and a day. And he, tried, he and his goons tried to snatch him out, and the townspeople drove them out and protected this former serf because they were protecting what was understood to be a traditional right of the cities. So where does natural rights come from? Well, in 1140, we get something called the Decretum of Gratian. Gratian was a canon lawyer. He's interested in the law of the church. And what he's doing for the first time in 1140 is bringing together church law into one single compendium. Up to that point, church law had been a very scattered affair. There had been papal statements, ecumenical councils, local councils, uh, biblical verses, penitentials, and they'd never actually been brought together and systematized into a coherent whole. So Gratian brings a lot of these sources together and publishes the Decretum. But when you look through this Decretum, naturally, if you're bringing together information from many sources, you may find contradictions, you may find duplications, whatever. So there was a, an attempt to refine Gratian's collection by means of various commentaries and glosses on them. And when the commentators went through the Decretum, one thing they found was the repeated use of a term, jus naturale, which might variably be rendered as natural law or perhaps even an early form of natural right. And they went and they listed all the different ways in which this term had been used historically. But when they, when they made that list, they added another meaning that you actually don't find in the ancient sources. The commentators on Gratian more, more or less uh, invented it. And they said that one of these meanings of this term can be a subjective power enjoyed by individuals. So they are groping toward the idea of a natural right as being something that, as individuals, each one of us is entitled to. Now, from the mid-12th century up to 1300, we start to see specific examples of natural rights uh, being put into practice and being recognized. And so I give examples. One of the earliest rights that was recognized by people as being a natural right, and therefore preceding any government, and being something that no government could overturn, was the right to appear and defend yourself against charges in a court of law. That's a natural right that you can't be deprived of by any prince. Likewise, over this 150 year period, we begin to see the development of the ideas of the rights of property, of self-defense, of marriage, as being a relationship entered into freely by free individuals exercising their freedom of choice, and still other areas, and these again being rights that adhere in the person as a person, and that people can't be deprived of by any political authority. So these are natural rights and cannot be taken away by the prince. Now because they're talking about natural rights, they are not claiming, even though this is a, a deeply Christian milieu, they are not claiming that Christians enjoy these rights, but if you're not a Christian, you know, we can, you know, knock your block off or something. To the contrary, in the mid-13th century, Pope Innocent IV made a statement that future commentators referred to quite often. Innocent IV said, ownership, possession, and jurisdiction can belong to non-believers licitly, for these things were made not only for the faithful, but for every rational creature. Well, that is the very heart of the idea of natural rights. Now, we move forward several centuries to the age of discovery. By the way, if there's anybody out here who has a bottled water that has not yet been opened, by the way, and consumed, um, if I could have a little liquidity, the good kind, uh, that would be a huge help to me. But uh, so if any, any administrative people who happen to hear this, that'd be super helpful. Um, 